This week on FX Guide TV. We head to San Francisco to sit down at ILM to look at the Oscar nominated film, The Force Awakens. Later, we look at the new courses on offer at fxphd.com. This and more coming up next. Hello, and welcome to FX Guide TV. And yes, I'll give you one guess what film we are covering this week. Yes, that's right, we are covering the most anticipated film of the year, Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. Everything you heard is true, all of it. So let's join John Montgomery in San Fran at ILM as he discusses the effects behind this most incredible film from director J.J. Abrams. So now obviously you've worked with J.J. on how many, mm -hmm. five films now? Uh, I've, done, I've done four movies four. with him, okay. yeah. Uh, Mission Impossible 3, the two tracks and now Star Wars. I did a little bit on um, Super 8, but you know, it was in the in the pre-production phase, yeah. Well, we know in talking to you in the past that there's, it puts a lot of importance on practical mm -hmm. effects and mm -hmm. bringing stuff as real as sure. possible. And how did that um, lead the process on mm -hmm. this film? I think when we, we have a certain way of, I, I think we've developed a certain way of working of, over the years, which is really about um, trying to photograph as much as possible. And obviously, I mean, in reference to, you know, the sort of the, the practical side, that, that, um, uh, that means that we're trying to capture anything that we can in camera. And um, in truth, he's very, he's very aware of what you can do in the digital world and mm -hmm. what you can do in the post, you know, post shoot. And um, if anything, I have tried to, um, I, th I think when you, when you do an effect, the foundation of the effect is the way that you shoot it in the first place, clearly. And I've always been a big proponent of trying to capture anything that you do in the right kind of light. And uh, I think I've even mentioned this before on your, mm -hmm. you know, on your, on your blog, but the, the, the idea to me is that if you can do that, then you're, you're, you, know, you have the right start for anything that you, you know, the right foundation for the work. People um, clearly um, wanted some kind of return to the sort of the, the, the sort of the DNA of those first three movies. And if you think about the way that they, you know, the, the environment that they were shot in, they were clearly shot at a time where it was harder to, to, to do visual effects. Just the process of doing anything was more difficult. And um, so invariably they tended to build sets where they could. They didn't rely upon, you know, set extensions or something like that. But the real difference to me, I think, is that if you, if you do have a set, then clearly you can light it. And you, if you can light a set, then that means that you, you inherently have something, something for the actors to respond to, for the, for the, for the sort of the template of any work that you do is sort of set just by the, by the very nature of building something. And so we really set out to build as much as we could in camera and to go to as many locations we could in, as, as we could and photograph as much as we could in camera. What that really means is though, that you know, you're still obviously doing a Star Wars movie and it would be foolish to sort of ignore the sort of the contemporary technology that's available to a modern filmmaker. So we just tried to, in simple terms, to plot the most efficient way of doing anything that we could and to build as much as we could. Now, quite often that really means that you're not really building very much or that you're not really capturing a lot in camera, but you're making that attempt, you're making that process, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to make it work. The technology that's available to you is just mind-blowing, really. You know, even for me, I work in this business. I'm shocked at, you know, how much we were, I think, to just blur the line between, you know, the reality of shooting something and the stuff that we did later. And a great example of that really is BB-8, you know, mm -hmm. where we built a, you know, Neil Scanlon and I um, had a lot of discussions about the approach to, to doing that droid. And... Um, we, uh, we set a, a, a sort of template. We had a number of different ways that you could control him, but there's a certain point where you just literally cannot do what you want to do with that droid. And uh, by building it and giving it a personality and a character and allowing the actors to sort of react to it in mm -hmm. camera means that they understand what it is that you're talking about and understand his performance. And by having 
um, you know, a puppeteer operate the, the droid, it meant that he had a personality. And now the actors can see that personality a lot of the time. But it doesn't mean that all of the work is done, you know, in camera. It just mm -hmm. means that he has a singular personality, I think. But once that was set, you know, we scanned him and we took, photo, you know, we did all the reference pictures and all that kind of stuff, of course. And we built our version of it, which is probably, um, you know, represents a third or something mm -hmm. like that of the work that, you, you know, you'll see BB-8 in. But even I sometimes would just look at the shots and couldn't remember, you know, which ones were real and which ones weren't. And, and that really is the... The, the, the benefit of having gone through that process because you just sort of establish this personality by building, you, you go through all the processes of building the real thing and by doing that you define the character so well. Yeah, absolutely, you know, it was, he's such a crowd pleaser, he's great, what a great character, you know. It's hot, you know, when you think about it, he's just a ball with a, this, you know, head on top and he doesn't have an eyelid or anything, you know, we can use to sort of, uh, you know, get emotions out of him, but it's amazing how much you know the puppeteers on set were able to actually bring the character out of that puppet mm -hmm. and really breathe life into him and make him such a lovable character. I mean, he's he's steals the show in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, it started off they were building the puppet in London, and they built it in the computer in a CAD model so they could actually mill the parts mm -hmm. for the actual puppet itself. And I asked, I said I was on the show very early on. And I said, can I grab that CAD model? Um, and so they sent it over and I sort of chopped it up in Maya and rigged it. And, you know, it was one of those things where a lot of sort of ideas came out of that, you know, a simple mm. animation test, only had a day, you know, to do something. And, uh, you know, one of the things that came out of that was the little antenna that wiggles, mm. you know. I decided that it would be kind of fun if, um, if his an antennas were very sort of flexible and wiggled a lot. So I animated it wiggling everywhere I went. So JJ enjoyed that and said, let's, just, let's do that. Um, one of the things I didn't do was make him weave as much as he does in the movie at, at the beginning. Hmm. When he moves, he really weaves from left to right. And seeing the CG, it looked like he was really sort of, you know, he was moving, but he wasn't sort of wiggling side to side in the CG test. And JJ just, you know, that's something that came out of that. And he said, what if we do that? You know, mm -hmm. we actually make him, it's, he just looks so sort of, you know, like, you know, sort of wooden in a way when he's moving from A to B, let's, let's have him weave around, you know. He's just, you know, just how to make him cute. And it, he is such a cute character. How do you convey emotion? That yeah. You mentioned that. But. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, you know, the position of his head on the ball, you know. A lot of the times when he's sad, you know, obviously the, the, the head will sort of droop forward mm -hmm. on, on the ball itself, you know, to convey that he's sad, you know, or popping the head back on the ball, you know, he's excited, you know, and interested in the head movements, snappy head movements, left, right, you know, he's excited, he's looking around. Those kind of little things, you know, um, really sort of help convey character for him. You know, he does this little fun little thing on the Falcon, this shot practically, of course, where he peeks around the corner, you know, and the, he sort of rolls out first and then the head comes mm -hmm. over and looks around the corner. Such a cool moment, you know. Um, a lot of times, you know, it, it's a surprising how much CG is in the movie of BB-8, you know. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of things that they couldn't do, even though they built, I think, three or maybe four um, different type styles of model to puppet to move him around. Um, there was a remote control one that they could drive remo remotely. Mm -hmm. There was another one that was probably the most common one where you would push him um, with, um, you know, the, the, the apparatus, the sticks, basically, mm -hmm. the controls, um, quite away from BB-8, like four or six feet away from it, and they could puppeteer his head and mm -hmm. roll the ball physically. Um, another one where he's just sort of still on the spot, and, you know, he doesn't actually move, and that's for more hero moments. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a few different styles of puppet. And then we had to sort of tie into that in CG. And the, it's amazing that the, the quality of the rendering is just unbelievable when you see him composited, you know, in a shot. It might cut away from a shot that is practical mm -hmm. and go straight to a close-up and a close-up CG. And I forget now when I look at yeah. it, I look and I, I go, is that, did we animate that? Or is that, is that the puppet? Or it's very hard to tell. There are stories about what happened. It's true.
You know, we started almost two and a half years ago, and one of the very first things we were able to do was start building the Falcon, because we knew it would be in the picture. Even before the script was finalized, we knew there'd be a Millennium Falcon. So we had the wonderful job of starting to build this thing. And, and, and as you say, one of the amazing things about it is we know it so well. Everyone mm -hmm. knows what the Falcon looks like. But if you really sit people down in a room and start talking about what the Falcon looks like, it's, it's sort of this collective hive mind of what the Falcon may look like. You know, and there's a five-foot model from episode four. There's a three-foot model from episode five. There was a full-scale build for all three of the first movies and our movie episode seven. So when it's your job to actually build a new, not a new, but a representation of that vehicle, there's, there, isn't, there isn't actually a Falcon. It seems like there is, but there isn't. Um, so you have to start figuring out what you need your Falcon to look like. Um, and, and, and it led to lots of long conversations you wouldn't believe about, you know, what should the gray value, basic gray value be of the Falcon? And what you're talking about is miniatures that were shot on film right. on stages. So even if you look at the miniature of the Falcon and the white paint is a certain value, well, on stage it was lit a certain way and it's different from shot to shot. You know, and we would, we would start doing test renders of our Falcon and you'd sort of show people and they'd say, no, nah, it looks too white. And someone else would say, no, nah, it looks too gray. Um, and, and again, so dialing in that uh, collective opinion of what this thing should look like took you know, two years of fiddling with it, really. Um, and the, the process started with partly a discussion on what should the Bible be. Okay. Um, and we really decided that it's the five foot episode four Falcon. And partly it's because we went to go see it, see this model. And it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, this thing. It's, it's, it's a high, really a high point, mm -hmm. I think, in effects, miniature building, and even industrial design. It's just right. a dynamite object. And everyone agrees it's dynamite. You look at it and think that's just gorgeous. Um, so you know, we wanted our Falcon to look like that. You know, we scanned it, mm -hmm. we photographed it. Um, and then you take that data. Uh, but our needs are not only do you need it to look like that, but we, we, we get closer to it. Mm -hmm. And talking about multiple use cases, we also acknowledge that in a VR experience, someone might walk up to this thing and look at a bolt on the, mm -hmm. you know, on the, on the door. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about how, you know, how far to go with detail. We went pretty far. It's a, it's a remarkably detailed model, our Falcon. It was luxury to actually go there to study the original miniature and design the, um, actually, that's another key word we always get, design language. We wanted to make sure the design language of this movie is literally coming from the original, the trilogy. So we studied, you know, what the design of these ships look like. And, um, and also one of the luxury was uh, the Paul Houston, who was the original, the member of the or crew of the Star Wars still works here. So we oftentimes when you talk to him, you know, what was the thought process and how you came up with this, this design. And always we looked up the, the Ralph McCurry and Joe Johnston's original sketch and the production design to incorporate what we designed in the ships. Um, now, you know, again, they're going to the, the archive and studying the miniature, there are a lot of detail that we didn't even see or we right. didn't even know. And uh, uh, we try to incorporate those, the, 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 you know, the level, the details in, the, in the, the, what we created in the CG. I think in the early chatter on the web where there is no CGI in the film is actually a testament. That's actually quite a compliment. Well, that, <laughs> that's, the, that's the big thing, is that you, you feel like there's a real responsibility here of, of making sure that, that that idea and that aesthetic that um, you don't want people to feel the CG that you're adding. And it's not that a lot of this is invisible effects. This isn't you know, a, a movie where you can have invisible effects. Mm -hmm. Obviously, everyone kind of looks at this and goes, okay, I, I understand a lot of this is created, but you want to have that feeling where they're watching it and they start to forget that they should be questioning things and they start to stop analyzing every little bit and they just sort of go with it. And that's where I think, you know, the real challenge comes in is getting people to forget that they're watching visual effects. I think we've done 2,100 visual effects shots. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a massive amount of work, you know, and um, I think you can't, you, you know, you, you just can't do this kind of movie without a huge, you, you can do, you can, you know, I'm very happy if people honestly believe that a lot of the stuff was done in camera. I think that's fantastic and they believe all of those things are really happening. I think that's wonderful, you know, but the truth is it's just a massive amount of work, yeah. Now, as far as digital characters on set, you touched briefly about the ability of, of actors mm -hmm. to actually interact with mm -hmm. these two. What was that process of 
doing digital characters on set and filming so that the actors would have something to react to? Well, we, you know, we had a number of, um, I mean, real, uh, well, you know, characters that have, you know, the, uh, we had An Andy Serkis, you know, played mm -hmm. one character, Snoke. And in his case, that, you know, the, the character itself was much bigger than, um, than, you know, that, that he was realized on set. So the way that we did that was we just put him always at the right height, you know, when mm -hmm. he was interacting with the actors. And we did a whole bunch of, you know, motion capture on Andy, strangely enough, you know, he's the sort of the master of that. And then um, we had uh, Lapita playing a character too. And Lapita's character was actually smaller than, a, you know, norm. she was a smaller person. But, um, and so we used, or, you know, we used a lot of different techniques to allow her to, to um, play her part on, on set and interact with all the actors and mm -hmm. you know get all the kind of eye lines and reactions correct. But um, we did do a lot and we did a lot of motion capture with her too. Lapita um, had never done anything like that before, mm -hmm. you know, um, the motion capture side of it and the technology side of it. Um, so she was a little bit intimidated, who wouldn't be, you know, mm -hmm. to walk onto a set and be that person who's dressed up in the funny suit, you know, mm -hmm. when everyone else is in sort of costume, traditional costume, and she's walking around with, you know, gray suit with bands on them and, you know, a big full head rig, you know, I mean, it is quite intimidating. So Andy's really used to that, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. he is the king of that. So really he was there to help her and talk her through it and, you know, and, and get her comfortable in that situation. And obviously he did a great job working with her, you know, as well as JJ, um, and just making her feel like she could give the performance, you know, and look through all this technology, you know, and, and just really give a, a pure performance to bring that character to life. What tools do you use in-house to actually help with that? Were there stuff that she could visualize her character or um, make easier facial capture that's without all the stuff in the way? You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's, you know, sometimes too much information can sort of cloud their judgment of what mm -hmm. their character should be. Okay. So I think JJ really wanted to, uh, you know, refrain from giving her too much information. I mean, there was definitely a maquette. They actually built a little maquette of her character and she, just so they could see the skin tone and you know how the skin would reflect light and the costume and all those sort of little details. But you know, he didn't really want to show her moving. You know, we didn't do any real time motion capture or anything like that on the set. I mean, we could have gone down that route, but um, you know, we wanted to, he, he wanted to her to give the performance and mm -hmm. for us to actually make that performance come to life on the screen. So did you end up using anything like um, similar to the face shift uh, technology that yeah. you have developed for years here internally? Yeah, I mean, face shift is a great fun piece of software and that was definitely um, sort of used on set to just see, you know, how somebody's performance could be put onto a character. But, it, you know, obviously for the movie, we have to, to really sort of... Um, take every nuance of her performance and, and map it onto the CG character. Um, and then we need to be able to manipulate that after the fact, you know, mm -hmm. with the animation um, department having an input, you know, to accentuate any sort of expression or change something along the line. So we have our own system here, um, in-house system to deal with the motion capture. We do the Medusa system, so mm -hmm. the Disney Medusa system, so we can actually um, capture all of her expressions in a camera array so we can actually build all the shapes that are needed to go into that system. So then we put all the markers on her face and we have the stereo head rig um, and it captures her performance and then basically that information is then solved into the R shape library and then that is sort of, um, sort of comes through with the creature in Maya um, and then you get a whole bunch of sliders for all the different shapes which are being driven by that capture, um, by that solve. Um, and then the great thing about it is, you know, you can go in there and you can tweak all those curves and you can make, you know, push an expression, you know, or, um, uh, you know, uh, change the eye tweet, you know, the eye direction or, you know, all that kind of stuff we can do after the fact. In case, you know, obviously in case JJ says, you know, I just need a bit more at this moment, we can go in there and do it. Yeah, we had this great moment, um, and this is something that, you know, sometimes you have these ideas, or um, JJ has these ideas anyway, that are 
um, you know we're going to kind of survive. And I think that, that idea of the X-Wings coming across the water was something that, that they came up with early on in the, in the script. And it was one of those things that you go, okay, that is such a cool moment. You know that's mm -hmm. going to be in there. And so we, we started working early on with uh, Rick Hankins, our effects, um, one of our effects leads who was coming up with, he, he sort of built our sim engine. And at the same time, he's one of the artists working on some of these shots. And uh, it was such a striking image, you know, uh, the, the thought of an X-Wing, first of all, in a daytime sort of uh, atmosphere, which I don't think is a thing that we've really ever seen mm -hmm. before in a Star Wars film. And just flying across the water like that and having those huge rooster tails of water. And of course, we looked at references of everything we could, cigarette right. boats, speed boats, and all of that. None of, well, and um, also we have the Blue Angels, you know, who practice right, right, out, right. Here outside ILM. So we were able to actually ask some of the artists, hey, send us your best photographs of these things and, and just checking out how, how those things look coming close to the water. Um, so we had a, a really good idea of what we wanted this to look like. But of course, once you have that reference, you have to sort of get that behavior out of the water. Mm -hmm. And so Rick spent a lot of time, you know, working uh, with Dan Pearson, our effect supervisor, and just sort of trying to get the, um, the rooster tails to behave the way we wanted. And then there's the, the art aspect of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that people probably don't even realize is that we started doing some of those early teaser shots. And, you know, things are still a little bit fluid in those early days. And so we worked a lot uh, with um, Yannick Dussault, our, our art director, who kind of came up with this sort of visual look of mm -hmm. what these things would look like. And we were sort of playing exactly to his artwork in, in terms of making those, those first early teaser shots. And then as we got closer and closer to the movie, it became more and more technically correct. Right. So a lot of it was you know, a buildup from, hey, here's the visual guide of how you want these, these rooster tails and these plumes to look, and to the end, which is, okay, now they're physically actually doing what they should have been doing from the, from the get-go. But you kind of you work your way into the, the physics of it all, and you sort of start with that, that artistic idea. I think that, that approach really paid off because it sort of set us up for a beautiful looking scene, you know, and I think when you see that scene in the mm -hmm. film, I think it's one of those really striking sort of like awesome visual moments. Uh, so where are we at regarding the state of deep compositing <laughs> ILM and at Star ILM. Wars? Uh, well, it's full, I mean, I guess the, the last time we probably spoke, it was a emerging technology and um, now it's, it's everywhere. Every, pretty much every effects pass that we do comes with a deep component. Every lighting pass that we, that we get comes with a deep component. We have a, um, something called deep IDs where uh, we're able to isolate all the geometry and using a, a custom deep pass, isolate that and, and tune, tune materials based on sort of their particle ID or the, actually their, I guess it would be their geom ID. Um, but it's everywhere and every, all the shots that we're doing now, any large shot where it's, uh, whether it's the X-wings over the water buzzing, buzzing the water or whether it's the, some hero shots at the end of the movie, which those are all done deep or they're at least all the explosions are deep, and then there's we sort of work, you know, two chains where there's a deep, pa a, sort of a deep stream and nuke and a non-deep stream nuke, and they're sort of seamlessly working. Well, not seamlessly sometimes, but they're working back and forth, and so everything we're doing is has a huge component of, of deep workflow at this point. What's the yeah. decision in doing uh, comp deep versus more traditional? What's the oh well, the you know, I think at this point we don't even make the choice to do it traditionally anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just so much easier for us to do it deep. And the question really becomes of whether the compositor will pre-comp the deep holdouts on their own early, uh, you know, early, or the, whether they'll keep it live deep. And that, that's the thing that we, that's the thing internally that we struggle with a lot is, should we keep on working on this live deep? Because it's extremely heavy to work that way. Or should we just say, you know what, I'm gonna pre-comp everything. It's gonna be much simpler as a, as a bunch of overs. And then at least if I need to, um, if so, one of the passes changes, I'll just take the hit and I'll run, you know, four hours of pre-comps to, to, to recreate all the holdouts. So that's still less time than it would be to send Sometimes back, it is, right? sometimes some you don't not. have that choice, yeah. Right. So, and what, yeah. about, what about some of the particle stuff? Is that using your the own? The particle stuff, it's, it's primarily using what's, what's in nuke. So like embers and snow and, you know, there's obviously all the, the stuff that's done. And we will create setups and check those in into our, into our sort of proprietary back-end setup. And um, we'll have that for, available for other people to use. And you know, obviously, you know, one of the things that's great about ILM is that pretty much every shot that we work on has a has a layout camera, mm -hmm. and so that gives us the flexibility to basically place, um, you know, exp whether it's an embers or snow or even canned explosions, things like that. We'll we'll have those available for us.
Well, so is that a combination of, is that Nuke's built-in particle system or original photographic elements? Because I know you guys have a huge yeah. library of those, or both. I, I would say that we use practical elements whenever we can, yeah. and then the particle systems within Nuke, if, uh, if we can't find an element. You know, there's a lot of times when the camera moves too much or we don't have, it doesn't have the right uh, lens or whatever, and mm -hmm. you have to use... You have to use uh, Nuke's particle system, and it's not a—it's not a, a bad option. But I, I always think that the, the practical is always better for me. I mean, I think there's a, there's reality to it, and there's so much complexity that happens in the practical elements in terms of you know the, whether it's the fall off of the embers or the snow or you know focus or whatever it is. Uh, we, we always choose elements first. Is there something can. similar to lightsaber? Do, is there a language or vocabulary for pro oh my processing? God. I mean, what do you to there's maintain huge, that look between yeah. various artists? Uh, well, there's huge vocabulary to lightsabers. I'm not sure if that's the question you were asking, okay. and then, and it's actually a, it's not a easy thing to get. You know, the 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 brightness, the color of the core, the fall off, the amount of fritzing, the amount of uh, little, you know, Kilo Ren's got his own um, saber, obviously, the little little sparklets that that pop off those those kinds of things. Those are, you know, we have a, a, effectively a style guide. That we're trying to get, and you have to do it. You have to enforce it over hundreds of shots. So, it's um, hundreds of shots, multiple locations. Hundred, <laughs> multiple locations, hundreds of shots. It's a mixture between the old lightsaber, Luke's saber, and um, the new one. So there's a lot. There's a lot uh, going on. Yeah. The new term has just started at fxphd.com and it is actually the 10th birthday of fxphd this year. Anyway, the new term is a cracker and here are the guys with the rundown on all the new courses. Hi, and welcome to the January 2016 term overview video. I'm John Montgomery. We'll be joined in just a bit by Mike Seymour from Sydney. Before we get to that, just want to let you guys know what this video is all about. It's a chance for us to showcase the new courses that we have on offer this term for you to hear directly from the profs what they have planned for their 10 courses or 10 classes that make up a course. But just want to point out that in addition to these 11 new courses you'll be seeing directly in this video, we have a wide variety of other courses on offer. They're repeats, courses that we've run from our past, member favorites, and we have over 100 on offer. So be sure to check those out on the Our Courses page. Thanks, John. Well, at FXPHD, we're kind of known for doing high-end training, really professional stuff that'll help take your career to the next level. So let's start with our most senior course, which is a VFX 305 course. For this new VFX term, we're going to start with this plate of a truck in the middle of a desert. And that's a very nice camera move, a lot of uh, movement, a lot of traveling, so we can do a lot of things. And the idea with this is to start with a uh, match move camera and then start to build set extension and a lot of effects. So I've done a quick concept to show you the idea. Basically, we would like to represent a few rocks here. So it's going to be 3D rocks, so modeling, texturing, look diving, all this kind of thing. Few elements buried in the ground like this, uh, metallic stuff, maybe old cars, we don't know yet. There's going to be a set extension for the background. So as a DMP, we are going to add like a very distant city, uh, maybe destroyed, maybe modern or futuristic, we don't know yet. And here uh, it's going to be the big FX part. We're going to create like a sandstorm. So that's the idea, like replicating a little bit what we have in Mad Max again, uh, but with this time not only the environments, but mixing with the old techniques. Uh, so FX modeling, 3D, um, DMP here, and of course compositing at the end. So what we're going to have to do is probably to split this term in two terms. So first one, we're going to start with everything here and maybe the, the the beginning of the the sandstorm and then second term we're going to finish uh, with the DMP we're going to mix everything together and create the full shot so again that's the plate so we're going to have a lot of camera move to do maybe a lot of uh, a bit of DMP on the top at the end as well and uh, a lot of different techniques for this VFX term so I hope you enjoy it and uh, feel free to join for this new term I started with this sort of image very nice colors very nice uh, atmosphere 
And uh, then I said, what could I do with uh, mixing these first images with these sort of cut rays and abandon it place? Uh, then I jump into something like this, which was crazy in terms of perspectives and openings. And I said, yeah, that's quite interesting. And actually, I think we could do something quite nice. And then I said, yeah, of course, we could do these sort of shots. You know, the one uh, that we have in Star Wars, the last episode, where we have this character, you know, going inside an abandoned ship like this and hanging here and trying to discover the whole place. So that would be something quite interesting to develop because that'd be quite big. We could use a lot of um, texturing, a lot of modeling to model the place and then creating a bit of lighting. So modeling, texturing, lighting, DMP on everything and then a small camera move to reveal a bit more of the place. So that's what we're going to do in the next DMP term. So feel free to join the term and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun in this. Hello, this is Daniel Smith, and I am thrilled to be back at FXPHD doing Nuke 234, Immersive VR Compositing. And this course is going to focus on creating a single shot for something called location-based entertainment, which usually exists at a fixed location that we can create immersive experiences akin to a ride film or a special event or a special presentation, usually coupling a motion base with a static screen and three-dimensional sets. The course is going to be very Nuke-centric. We're going to be spending a lot of time in Nuke. We're going to be using Nuke to prototype our ride. We're going to be using Nuke to create the final composite for the imagery that will be projected on the screen, as well as using Nuke to simulate a virtual reality recreation of the final ride environment. We're going to be making a shot of this troll, this troll that is going to be in a forest and it's going to be reaching out at the audience as we pass by him. And it's going to come up with a lot of very interesting problems that we're going to have to solve through creative compositing and some interesting solutions that will augment the immersive VR component of this course. We're going to be using VR tools such as the Oculus or Gear VR or the Google Cardboard. And we're going to be using these to see our end results. But in order to do that, we're going to be creating a 360 degree stereoscopic rendering in lat long space. And then we're, of course, we're going to be using our virtual reality goggles to see our final shot and experience it in VR. What's really unusual about this particular kind of effect is that it is always contingent on a moving point of view. So we're creating a visual effect shot from a particular point of view that is constantly changing. And the real key to this course is how we're going to fold this into the emerging technologies of virtual reality. I'm so excited to bring you Nuke 234, Immersive VR Compositing. So I'll see you in class. So those are new courses and more to come, but I just want to flag, of course, we highlight in this O-Week video the new courses that are introduced, in addition to the hundreds of other courses available here at FXPHD, and the full listing is on the site. And along, of course, with any new subscription to FXPHD, you get Background Fundamentals, which is our behind the scenes kind of background info, the kind of primer that you need, because things are gonna hit your desk, opportunity is gonna come along, and you're gonna to need to have that background information to be able to say, hey, I've got something that I could apply there. So we hit the SciTech winners, we hit the latest SIGGRAPH papers, we speak to people with new bits of tech, new bits of camera gear, uh, new ideas. Obviously not an entire course that builds week by week, but individual kind of magazine style pieces. And I'm very proud of that course. It's proven to be one of the most popular and enduring parts of FX PhD. We have a brand new After Effects course based on creating expressions in After Effects, which are obviously really an indispensable tool that you need to know when using the app. In addition to that, Arnold for Summa 4D was released last year, so we've got a new course focusing on that. And finally, our first ever programming course. So if you want to create a plugin 
for Premiere or After Effects, this course is for you. But let's go ahead and hear directly from the guys what they have planned for their various courses. Hello everyone, I'm Matthias Möll from marmoworld.com and I'm looking forward to see you this term in my beginner course for After Effects scripting. Scripting is like programming your own little robot which performs complicated or tedious tasks in After Effects for you fully automatically. With writing a few lines of code, you can save you hours and hours of time, in particular if your work involves many repetitive tasks. The main example that we will follow mostly on in this course is a script to adjust the content of a lower third. In a convenient user interface, you just enter the desired text and some other parameters, like the desired color and logo icon, and with a single click, the script updates the After Effects project accordingly. But the goal of this course is of course not that you only replicate this one example script. My goal is that you learn everything you need to write your own scripts. Scripting is a huge topic and we cannot cover all of it. Therefore, I will show you how to use the scripting reference and other materials efficiently, such that after finishing the course, you will be able to continue developing your scripting skills on your own. But I'm also aware that as an After Effects artist, you are most likely more of an artistic and creative person than a programming geek. So don't be afraid. You don't need to know anything about programming at all to follow this course. I will make your first steps in the scripting world as easy as possible. Hi everybody, my name is Da Costa and I'd like to welcome you to our new C4D 221 course called Using Arnold in Cinema 4D. Earlier in 2015, the Arnold render engine became available for Cinema 4D. So in this term, we will get you up and running with Arnold. In 10 weeks, this course will demonstrate all the fundamentals about working with this render engine. At the end of this semester, you should feel comfortable taking on any project with Cinema 4D and the Arnold render engine. In our first class, we will introduce you to Arnold. Right after that, we will quickly get you comfortable using Arnold by completing a few short projects from beginning to end. In our second class, we will look at everything related to lighting in Arnold. In class number three, we will discuss everything there is to know about render settings. In the first half of our fourth class, we will explore the important Arnold standard shader. In the second half of this lesson, we will take a look at some other shaders that comes shipped with Arnold. In week number five, we will step it up a notch and take a look at more complex shading techniques. We will also take the opportunity to look at free third-party Arnold shader libraries and implement them into our own shader networks. We will dedicate week number six completely into lowering render times by looking at all kinds of workflow techniques and tips on how to actually achieve this all important goal. In our seventh week, we will focus on compositing options and multipass workflows with Arnold. In our eighth week, we will take a look at different ways in which Arnold and Cinema are integrated. We will look at the integration between popular Cinema 4D aspects such as splines, particles and the MoGraph module. In our ninth class, we will shade, light and render an interior scene from beginning to end. And in our final class, we will shade, light and render an exterior scene from beginning to end. So I'm very excited about this class and I hope to see you soon in the FX PhD forums. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be back, this time teaching such a hardcore subject as CC++ plugin development. We'll begin by designing and coding a seemingly simple vignette for Adobe Premiere and After Effects. Learn just enough classical C to be able to understand the provided samples and see how the recent changes to C++ have made it more accessible to ordinary or even casual developers. Afterwards, we'll look at cross-platform development and explore the arcane subjects of floating point and GPU processing and also learn the difference between ARGB and BGRA color spaces. At the end of this course, you should be able to create your own custom plugins and know where to seek help if need be. 
Previous scripting or coding experience is helpful but not required. Everybody is welcome to join the ride. Well, welcome back, my friend, Ben. How hey, are you? Mark. Good, good. And really excited about this course because I think the idea of focusing on production value uh, is, has got so much scope because uh, there are so many different things you can do to add production value in different ways, different techniques that you can use to, to really make something much more interesting than it otherwise might be. And you've been doing a bit more of this work lately, haven't you? I have that actually, happens? yeah, been doing a bit of this work for, for government and law firms, and, um, which puts you in some really interesting, challenging situations sometimes. And there's some great techniques that you can kind of use to make those situations work and make them actually beneficial to the end product. I mean, obviously, I've done an enormous amount of interviews uh, for all over the world. And sometimes you are in those locations, like you're at a trade show. Sometimes you're in somebody's corporate office. Sometimes you're in a studio. We won't be just doing stuff in a studio. We'll really go out in those real world environments. But for me, just even when you talk about just an interview, which is just a small part of what we'll be looking at in one sense, you know, you can have an interview where it's just that person being interviewed and you don't see the interviewer. But you can have a two people on shot together like we are. Uh, two cameras separately shooting across shoulders. Like, there's a ton of stuff there. Someone looking straight at the camera, someone looking beside camera, making all of those work. And, and that's the kind of more stage stuff. There's actually some really cool stuff making things look unstaged and more natural that you've been doing. Yeah, and that, that can be actually quite challenging, quite difficult to make something look like it's not set up and staged, um, but still watchable and not annoying. And so all of those techniques will uh, affect what the audience takes away from it, and also how the, the project works in terms of what your options are with editing and things like that. And also, of course, we should point out this isn't just about, say, cameras, right? This is everything. And that's the exciting thing about um, uh, talking about production value is that it takes in cameras, lighting, sound, uh, workflow. All of these issues come into play when you're talking about production value. So, so it's kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying this is the state of the art and these are some really cool new techniques, apps, uh, tricks, for getting great production value. I'm looking forward to it, Ben. Yeah, it should be good. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Moto 205 course this semester. Throughout the classes, we'll be covering the Moto shader tree and materials within Moto. We'll be using some pretty cool models to cover all the different aspects of materials and shading inside of Moto. We'll start by covering the Moto shader tree and all the various aspects and elements that create it to create our final image. We'll look at all of the different options that we have for our shading models and we'll go in depth on each one of these settings and how these affect our different materials. We'll cover all of the most important materials such as metal and how we can give it the exact look that we want. We'll also cover the hair and fur shader and how we can use that to make hair and grass elements such as you see here. We'll cover all of these shader elements using some pretty cool real-world model production-ready examples. We'll also look at organic materials such as this egg from Aliens, and we'll learn how to create our own texture maps for painting, and we'll also learn about the different textures that we can use inside of Moto to create some pretty cool effects that mimic organic material. We'll also cover plastics and glass and the different options we have for subsurface scattering and transparency that will create the look, illusions, and luster that we're after. We'll also take a look at the new Moto projection shader and projection texture items and how these can help us create really cool matte paintings inside of Moto. And finally, we'll look at the render settings within our shader tree and the different settings that we have to eliminate some problems that we might run into through our renders, such as noise in the reflection, shadows, weird banding issues that we might get, and all of the other different settings that will allow us to eliminate and make better, cleaner renders as fast as possible. We're also going to look at Moto's nodal-based workflow and how this can help us create even more powerful and more complex shaders within our shader tree. So I look forward to seeing you in the course, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Our new course is designed to take you through all the key features of the latest version of the Foundry's Katana, version 1.1. As Katana's render agnostic, we've chosen to use RenderMan 20 as our key renderer for the course. During the 10 classes, we're going to be focused on two main projects. One will be all CG and the other live action. Our projects are going to focus on two key areas that Katana is most often used in, look development and lighting. During the first half of the course, we're going to be cover a multitude of things, including an overview of Katana's history, preparation of 3D assets coming out of Maya, importing those assets, geometries, cameras into Katana itself, and then creating basic primitives as and when we need them. Then building collections using cell or collection expression language. 
Using Render Man object settings and Render Man render settings, creating materials, and then assigning those materials to geometry. Then we'll be looking at the gaffer and how we can use it to create lights and use lights within Katana, setting up render passes, and then creating a look dev file. In the second half of the course, we're going to be focusing on things like building a look development template, setting up interactive render filters, looking at the 2D compositing side of the tools within Katana, working out key lighting stages for the project, in-depth lighting techniques, again, obviously using Render Man, how we can do animation within Katana, editing look development files, setting up render passes, creating groups and live groups, building macros and super tools, working with attributes, understanding resolvers, and how instancing works within Katana. Katana is being used by some of the top visual effects companies in the world. Industrial Light and Magic, MPC, Digital Domain, Sony, Pixar, and Tippett Studios, to name a few. So we've designed this course specifically for anybody interested in learning Katana for the first time, or an existing Katana artist that's looking to fill in the gaps and take their skills to the next level. It's obviously a 200 level course because it is going to be complicated. It's not a beginner's course, but it is aimed at people new to Katana. Hi, and welcome to FX PhD Katana 203. On this class, we will see how to do the lighting and the look dev in Katana and Renderman 20. So basically, we will start with these plates and we will do all the look dev for the trunk. At the end, we will see these plates with these Man Max references from uh, the previous classes in texturing for the trunk. And we will see first of all how to export everything in Katana from Maya. So basically, the first classes will be focused on the layouts and the setup of the camera for the trunk and uh, everything in Maya. And then we will export everything in Alembic to, from Maya to Katana. We will see how to create this setup with the light here, the different material assigned to the different objects, the different render setting for renderman, and how to render a batch render from Katana. Finally, we will see at the end how to adjust and everything, everything in uh, in York. I hope you enjoy. See you next time. Well, that's it for the look at our new courses running this term at fxphd.com. But in addition to those I mentioned earlier, we have a wide variety of repeat courses, over 100 on offer. So check those out at fxphd.com slash courses. And before we close out, just want to mention one more bonus extra in addition to background fundamentals and the discussion forums, and that's our VPN software. We have a wide variety of the full, unrestricted versions of various software applications. And basically, you create a secure connection between your computer and our server, which allows you to run those versions. It's a great way to learn, follow along with the course material, and build shots for your reel. The only restriction is you actually can't make money utilizing our VPN software. But again, it's a great way to take your career to the next level. Well, that's it for this O Week video. Really appreciate you taking the time to watch, and we hope to see you in the forums. Now, as you can imagine, we have been looking forward to covering this since we first heard about it. In fact, one of our editors even bought multiple tickets to five different sessions before it even opened. Mike, of course, refused to see it on anything less than IMAX 70 mil. But, you know, let's just say we were all very envious of John being able to cover this story. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and until next time, let the force be with you. I've always wanted to say that. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.